Welcome everyone to this final video analysing Macbeth and considering how Lady Macbeth is presented throughout the play. Today we're going to focus on Act 5, Scene 3 and we're going to analyse Act 5, Scene 5 as well. However, I will be explaining what happens in Act 2, the start of Act 3, Act 4 and then also what happens at the very end of the play because I don't think I can allow you to finish watching these videos without understanding how everything ties together. However, the central focus, as always, is how is Lady Macbeth presented. Even though we don't see her in any of these scenes, there are still some comments that I think we can unpick so that we can see whether or not she is a strong or a weak character or a combination of both. As always, this is for the WJC English Literature Non-Examination Assessment. What we are going to focus on today is how is Lady Macbeth's character presented in these scenes? And what I'm looking for is for every single one of you to understand what happens in Act 5, Scene 3 and Scene 5. Most of us will be able to consider how Lady Macbeth is presented through Macbeth's speech. And finally, we should be able to consider how Lady Macbeth exhibits weaknesses. In the last video I made for you, we focused on Act 5, Scene 1. And in that scene, we saw Lady Macbeth furiously rubbing her hands every night when she goes to sleep, trying desperately to absolve her guilt, to wash off the metaphorical blood from her hands and finding it completely imp impossible. She walks in her sleep, she speaks, she reveals secrets that she should not be revealing, and it generally shows that she has lost control of herself completely. The Doctor and the Gentlewoman are the two characters who observe what she says. In Act 5, Scene 2, we switch to focusing on some of the thanes in Macbeth's army. We see Menteth and Cathnus and Agnes and Lennox, so lots of important people who should have loyalty towards the King. However, in this scene, they start to reveal that their loyalty to Macbeth is in the wrong place, and they start to shift their allegiance to other characters who are approaching um, Scotland. So these Thanes are discussing how the English forces are approaching, and they are led by Malcolm, Seward, and Macduff. Malcolm, they believe, is the rightful heir to the throne, and therefore these Thanes begin to move their allegiance towards him. Macbeth, however, is in Dunsany, but these men who are rising up against him are calling him mad and believe that he has stolen the throne. And this group then begin their march towards Burnham Wood, and they meet up with the English forces. At the beginning of Act 5, Scene 3, Macbeth is angrily dismissing those who bring him reports of the attack. He's frustrated. And he reassures himself that he is invincible and he cannot be scared because these witches have given him prophecies that he will never be able to be killed. He calls for his armour to be brought to him by a character called Satan. And then we see the Doctor having a conversation with Macbeth about the state of Lady Macbeth. And that's the part of this scene that we are going to analyse today when the Doctor and Macbeth have that conversation. So we begin analysing this scene when Macbeth gives this command. Give me mine armour. How does your patient, Doctor? The Doctor responds with, Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Notice at the beginning how Macbeth is dominant and in charge here. That imperative verb is being used, in the same way that Lady Macbeth used lots of imperative verbs when she was asking for strength. He seems to be commanding, he seems to be completely dominant, and he seems to be able to remain and maintain control over himself. He focuses on his armour, and this shows that he is asking for protection. And it shows that he no longer needs other people, because he believes at this point that he has absolute divine power. He believes that he cannot be killed by any mortal man, or any man who's born of a woman. Notice here about how he is focused almost entirely on himself first, 
and only after that he moves on to talk about his wife. Notice the word me in that first line. When he does ask about his wife, he uses these words. How does your patient, doctor? You'll notice straight away that he doesn't say, how does my wife? He says, how does your patient? And I think it shows a detachment there. Not how is my wife, which be that, be that possessive pronoun. The pronoun your shows that, that level of alienation, that level of estrangement between these two characters. And also, he doesn't describe her as Lady Macbeth, he describes her as the noun patient, and I think that shows very little emotion, and very little tenderness towards his wife. Now, we could argue this in lots of different ways, but one way of looking at this is when Lady Macbeth sees Macbeth as weak, she considers him ill, and she uses lots of imagery of sickness. Here, Macbeth can see that his wife is showing weakness, and therefore that imagery of sickness creeps into his vocabulary as well. So he sees her as the weakness. She doesn't see her as the person that she once was. The doctor says, not so sick, my lord. And this reveals that Lady Macbeth is not suffering from a physical illness. This is a psychological illness. This is her mental state that is fraught, not her physical body. If she was suffering from a physical illness, we'd feel sorry for her because that's out of her control. Because it's a psychological illness, we could consider that Lady Macbeth is feeling these emotions and is feeling this illness because of her own bad deeds earlier. Now, this is a very contentious issue because in today's society, someone who struggles with their mental health is clearly nothing to do with them. It's, you know, it's not their fault at all. However, with Lady Macbeth, because we've seen what she's done wrong, we can see that this psychological condition is a consequence of what she did so wrong earlier. And therefore, we can see that justice is taking place. Essentially, Shakespeare is showing us that evil people can do evil deeds to get ahead. However, at the end of it all, there is a price to be paid. And Lady Macbeth is now paying that price. When he says, as she is troubled, that word troubled, I think we've probably used quite a few times to describe Macbeth up until this point. Now it is Lady Macbeth who is the one who is troubled in the mind. And that shows that this is her mental state. And it also shows that she is plagued by her actions and plagued by her grief. She is no longer in control of her mind, like we saw in Act 5, Scene 1. But we've seen this from Macbeth before. So there's a clear reversal in the role here. Lady Macbeth was the one who was absolutely dominant over her emotions, and now it's the other way around. Macbeth is the cold and callous character, and Lady Macbeth is the one that is suffering. Shakespeare then uses the words with thick coming fancies, and this shows that Lady Macbeth is completely out of control. She is bombarded by images and haunted by memories. She can no longer conquer her emotions, which was one of her big strengths, we thought, at the start of this play. The final line on your screen says that keep her from her rest. You'll notice the word keep her and rest show that it is interrupted. She cannot get relief. She cannot escape the consequences of her actions. Because I think Lady Macbeth is suffering because of what she's done. This is the consequence of her evil actions. And in a Jacobean society, they were used to Christian beliefs of justice. They used to believe that, you know, we live our lives well so that good things will happen to us. And if we do bad things, we will be punished. That's how a Christian society works. So seeing someone evil get their comeuppance at the end of a play is something that was almost expected when it comes to a Jacobean society. After the doctor's explanation, Macbeth responds with this. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a roots, rooted sorrow. Raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. The beginning of Macbeth's speech here 
he again res re resorts to using those imperative verbs. And he does this throughout this speech. He uses cure, pluck, raise, cleanse. He tells the doctor to try and fix Lady Macbeth. And it comes across as quite dismissive. The doctor's just explained that Lady Macbeth is in serious peril and that her mental state is deteriorating. And clearly he gives a quick command for it to be fixed. He uses four words in that first line. All of them are monosyllabic. Cure her of that. And I think that reveals that he has little empathy here. And the frustrating thing is that we've seen Macbeth really struggle mentally, particularly after Duncan is murdered. He's almost catatonic. He almost cannot speak. He can't um, move on with conversations. He's purely focused on what happened. And here he shows no empathy towards his wife. It shows that he's commanding the doctor to fix her, to fix his wife. His wife is not right, so she needs to be fixed quickly. Almost like he's looking for an easy solution to this problem. I think there's very little care of his wife here, and more that he wants her to be fixed so that she no longer causes a problem. The second word used, which is her, and again that third person pronoun, shows little affection towards his wife, and it shows that continuing estrangement between him and Lady Macbeth. And then finally that word that at the end of that sentence, it shows that Macbeth does not name her condition. He doesn't seek clarification, he doesn't ask the doctor what can I do to help, he just wants her to be cured as quickly as possible. He doesn't want to dwell on those problems that Lady Macbeth is having. When he says, canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, he's asking the doctor, can't you, can't you do something, can't you give something to fix her? Isn't there an antidote out there somewhere? Isn't there a potion that we can give her to fix this? And it suggests here at the end of that particular line, where the word diseased is used, her disease that she is suffering from is her guilt. And that guilt is cancerous or gangrenous. It's an infection in her body, not a literal infection, but a mental infection. And Macbeth is looking for that to be removed quickly or to be resolved, even though those types of conditions require much more care and attention than a simple potion to help. He then resorts to asking the doctor to pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow. And if you think of that imperative verb pluck, I think it shows a lack of care or precision. He's not really thinking about his wife. He simply wants her memories to be ripped out of her head so that she'll be fixed and normal again. So I think he's focusing more on how he can remove the illness rather than how the issues can be resolved. So he says, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow. And this is the problem that Lady Macbeth has. Her memory has rooted pain in it. And that comes from the murder of Duncan. So it is the memory that is the problem. And the problem is that she is consumed by those memories. So Macbeth simply wants the doctor to reach inside her mind, metaphorically, and pull out the problems, just like an infection, rip out the part that's infected so that she can be normal again. Now, he doesn't seek to reverse the actions, but he seeks to remove the memory of it. So Macbeth doesn't say, I wish I didn't kill Duncan. What he's saying is that he wishes Lady Macbeth didn't know about it. He then says, raise out the written troubles of the brain. And here the word raise, again another imperative verb, means to erase, to take away, to remove. And we know that what is done cannot be undone, and yet Macbeth wants it to just disappear. And again, I'll mention again, he doesn't want Duncan to come back to life again. He wants Duncan to be dead, him to be king, and his wife to be fine. He wants everything to be perfect. He doesn't realise that those actions have had consequences. He mentions it much earlier in the play. Here, he simply wants his wife to be strong enough to put up with those emotions. So raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet, oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom. 
So here we've got this idea of an antidote, but it's a sweet, oblivious antidote. And I think the adjective sweet shows that sometimes forgetfulness gives peace. He wants Lady Macbeth to forget all of the evil actions so that she can live in, um, in kind of an oblivious state. But the word antidote shows that he simply wants to expunge that memory, not deal with the issue, just remove the problem. And the problem is that memory. And then he finishes with cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. And the word cleanse shows that he wants her to be purified, to take away that pain. However, we know that her soul is so evil that it cannot be untarnished. That's a way a Christian Jacobean society would think. If you do bad things, then you cannot be clean. If you do good things, then you'll be rewarded for good. So what we see is justice. And yet Macbeth doesn't see that that justice is, un he sees that as unfair. The final part I'd like to mention is the last line we says, which weighs upon the heart. And here I just pick out the word weighs, which shows how heavy imagery. Now, Lady Macbeth attempted to ascend. She, tempt she attempted to rise. She wanted to be from the wife of a thane to the wife of a king. She wanted to move up in the world. And I think the irony is that by trying to improve her situation, her situation has actually become worse. So she's attempted to ascend, but she's being dragged down now by those feelings of guilt and regret. The doctor then reveals that Lady Macbeth is beyond help, that he cannot solve her issues. He says, therein the patient must minister to himself. Macbeth responds to this with, throw physics to the dogs. I'll none of it. Come, put mine armour on. Give me my staff. Now, if we look at what Macbeth says first, he uses the word throw. And this line, throw physic to the dogs, is a very famous line. Now, on the one hand, it could be seen as him discarding the need for medicine. And that may suggest that he sees Lady Macbeth as weak in this instance. Or he could be suggesting because medicine cannot solve Lady Macbeth, he's then deriding medicine. He's throwing medicine away because it can't solve his problems. When he says, I'll none of it, it shows that he does not need medicine. He is strong and he can deal with the mental anguish, but Lady Macbeth cannot. And I would suggest here, this is where we see a clear reversal in the characteristics of these two characters. At the beginning, we saw Lady Macbeth who didn't need any help. She was master of her own emotions and she was able to solve all of her problems herself. Now we see it the other way. Lady Macbeth has become reliant and Macbeth is the person becoming frustrated. After that, he moves on and deals with the other issue that's going on in his life at the moment, which is the fact that there are soldiers marching towards him. So he says, come, put mine armour on, give me my staff. So he moves away from talking about the weaknesses of his wife, and then he begins talking about the strength that he possesses. So it's showing that he has this physical power, and it might suggest that he no longer thinks of her. He puts her to the back of his mind so he can focus on what's in front of him. And this could suggest a heartlessness in Macbeth and perhaps that he's become unloving towards his wife. Give me my staff also shows that he wants his, his weapons in order to uh, take on the army in front of him. After that, the scene continues. Macbeth continues his conversation with the doctor and asks the doctor, is this something that he can do using his medicine to cure the insubordination in Scotland and to calm everything down? The doctor obviously does not have that type of power. We then move on to Act 5, Scene 4. And in Act 5, Scene 4, we see the Scottish lords gather with Malcolm, Macduff and their army that's marching from England. And they meet at a place called Burnham Wood. And we've already heard Burnham Wood mentioned in this play already. To cover and camouflage their numbers, they decide to cut down the boughs of the trees in Burnham Wood because they're going to use that to cover the amount of soldiers in their army. Now, this already makes us think of one of the prophecies that Macbeth was given. 
Macbeth was told that he would not be able to be killed until Burnham Wood marches on Dunsandane. So what we can see is one of the predictions of those witches begins to come true and it begins to bring us towards the unfavourable conclusion for Macbeth. Moving on to Act 5, Scene 5, which is the final scene that I'd like to analyse whilst looking at the character of Lady Macbeth. We see Macbeth, Seton and the soldiers with their drums and their colours on stage. The drums and the colours suggest that war is coming and that the story is building towards a crescendo or towards a climax. Macbeth begins by saying, Hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dearful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. Now, whilst I'm not going to analyse this part with you, because it doesn't reveal anything about the character of Lady Macbeth, I think it's worth mentioning that Macbeth's confidence is incredibly high at this stage. Even though his wife is ill, Lady uh, Macbeth feels confident, he feels strong, he feels powerful, and he does not believe there is anyone out there who will be able to storm his castle and to defeat him. If you look at some of the language being used, he's going to laugh a siege to scorn, and he says that we might have met them dearful. It shows that he feels incredibly confident. It also reveals that Macbeth has lost a lot of his power too, because those things who should be there backing him up, they have defected over to the side of Malcolm. We then have a punctuated cry of women within. So whilst he has this confident war cry as he's trying to rally his soldiers, we have a noise that comes from the stage, and that cry is of women. And he says, what is that noise? Now I think this reveals a little bit about Macbeth at this stage. First of all, it shows that he does not know what is going on. He does not have that power or that control. A good king should know what's going on at all times. Macbeth does not know. It's almost like he has neglected that part of his, um, of his kingdom. And this is something that we see in lots of um, Shakespeare's other plays, particularly in King Lear. And it might show that he's not quite in touch with what's happening under his charge. Seton says, it is the cry of women, my good lord. Now, Macbeth's role as king and as regent should be to protect those people in his charge. However, he hasn't been focusing on the people that he's supposed to look after. He's been too focused on maintaining his power. Then Seton exits and Macbeth speaks. I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been... My senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full with horrors. Dianus, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. What we see is that Macbeth no longer has any affiliation with the feeling of fear. He no longer succumbs to it. He has no fears. Now this is an enormous contrast to his fear of betrayal and murder. We've seen him scared, we've seen him worried and frightful. Now it's almost like all of that emotion has been excised from his body. Much like at the beginning when Lady Macbeth tried to excise all of her emotions and womanly goodness. It seems to be that he's purged his human emotions. And we saw the consequences of purging your human emotions with the character of Lady Macbeth. She tried to get rid of her emotions and it led to her going mad. It led to her somnambulism. When he says the time has been, my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, it shows that he is no longer um, the type of person who will suffer from pain. He's become numb and cold-hearted and callous, much like we've seen in Lady Macbeth's character. And if you remember when um, he killed Duncan, 
that owl that was shrieking really affected him. When he says, and my fell of hair would have a dismal treatise rouse and stir, as life were in it, he tells us that in the past, and this is in the past tense, that his body would have shown that something was going wrong. Naturally, human beings, if they're frightful, the hair will stand on its end. Well, here Macbeth is saying that his hair no longer stands on end. It's almost like he's become numb. He knows the nightmares of life and now fears nothing and therefore doesn't have that connection with human emotion anymore. He then says, I have supped full with horrors, direness, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. The word supped there shows that it's almost like he's consumed so much evil. So he's had his fill of evil and his body has therefore become consumed by it. It's almost like there's no room for emotion. The more evil he's done, the more goodness has been pushed out and he no longer has those emotions. Very similar in its use of imagery with Lady Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 5. He then suggests that these, this direness, this familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. It shows that he has lost the ability to feel forever. And in a Jacobean society, we should be careful about those people who do not, are, who are not in touch with their human emotions. Emotions are fundamentally good in a lot of Shakespearean plays. And that's because to be human is to have emotion. Without emotion, our conscience disappears. If you cannot love, it is easier to hurt people. If you cannot feel fear, it is evil to do bad things. So emotions are very much our moral compass. And therefore, if we lose our emotions, we also lose our morality. And that is a very dangerous thing in society. Seton then re-enters and Macbeth says, wherefore was that cry? So Macbeth is trying to find out where did that cry come from? And Satan says in very short monosyllabic words, the queen, my lord, is dead. And at this moment, we get the end of Lady Macbeth's story. She is no longer alive. She is dead. Now, we are not told specifically what happens to Lady Macbeth but lots of productions will do it a little differently. Some productions might have Lady Macbeth's body brought onto stage so that we can see the consequences of her actions. Some people suggest that she's killed herself. Some people suggest that she's jumped from one of the towers in the castle. But Lady Macbeth has died. Now, it wouldn't be natural for someone to literally die of madness or literally die of uh, sleepwalking. There is a strong assumption here that Lady Macbeth has committed suicide. She's killed herself because she cannot deal with the guilt that she feels. So the language itself is very simple, it's direct and it's shocking. For the audience, they might react in two ways. A modern audience can feel sorry for Lady Macbeth because as a woman, she was placed in a very difficult position. We can feel sorry for her as a modern audience. A Jacobean audience, perhaps, would see this as the justice that was deserved. She did evil things, and therefore bad things happened to her. Very often, a Jacobean society would believe in an eye for an eye. So if you do something bad, something bad will happen to you. So this ends Lady Macbeth's presence in the play. After the shocking revelation of Lady Macbeth's suicide, we then get to see how Macbeth responds to this, how he reacts to the death of his wife. Now, whilst in this next part, we don't see Lady Macbeth and whether or not she's a strong or a weak character, I do think it's worth me explaining this short speech. It's such a famous speech from a Shakespearean text that I think it's worth you knowing it. And it will be interesting to see how Macbeth responds to that level of pain. Macbeth says, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Now, this can be seen as quite an ambiguous short monologue. 
it can be seen in lots of different ways. So I'll just outline a couple of ways that it could be seen. First of all, he might mean she would have died anyway. You know, human beings come to an end at some point, so she was going to die anyway, so this is not news to me. If that's the case, then that shows him to have no emotion, no remorse, no regret at all. And that would make him sound really cold and callous and unfeeling. However, it could be seen as him looking at the news of her death and believing that it might have been better later when he isn't preparing for war. Almost like this is an inconvenience. He'd have preferred to have found this out after the war. Either way, both of those reveal that he's not showing that level of emotion you would expect a husband to show their wife upon their death. Now, the word hereafter, I think, is a really interesting word, and it's not, oft, it's not commented on often enough, I don't think. So the word here is in the present. If you're here, that means you're here right now. But the word after means when the present has turned into the past. So it's almost like he's focusing on the inevitability of death, how all of us move one day from the present and we become extinguished and move into the past. So he's focusing on how Lady Macbeth was here and now she is no longer here. Where he says there would have been a time for such a, a word, that part might suggest that this is the wrong time for this news to be delivered. And then we have this repetition of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And I think that's a really um, interesting line to unpick. Now, he may be referring here to how life continues without pause. You know, one day is following another day is following another day until life inevitably ends. He descends into a speech of looking at the futility of life, almost asking, what is the point in life when all that happens is we move from day to day and then at some point we're gone? His life has become futile. He's become pessimistic. He then says, creeps in this petty pace from day to day. Got that image of life trudging on and on and on for absolutely no reason at all. It makes life almost seem empty, meaningless, pointless. He then says to the last syllable of recorded time. And at some point we have a last syllable. Our time is over. He's suggesting that all life ends. Lady Macbeth's does, his will, everyone he's ever met will also succumb to the inevitability of time. And he then says, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. What he does is he compares humankind like lighted fools. Fools holding a candle, desperately looking for light, desperately looking for meaning, desperately looking for something important. However, we're all just simply stumbling in the dark, looking for meaning, only to find out that there is none. It's a very pessimistic way of looking at life from Macbeth at the end of this text. And then he describes dusty death, suggesting that we all just turn into dust. So what was the point? Okay, very little meaning to life being suggested. Now we might ask the question, why is Macbeth, after hearing Lady Macbeth's um, news of, of, de of death, why has he descended into absolute pessimism? Previously, he was preparing for war. He was becoming confident. He knew that he was in a difficult position because his things had defected. What we see now is it's almost like his life has become empty. I would argue that his life was probably empty before. Okay, but Lady Macbeth's um, death has clearly shown how empty he is inside. And the fact that he's not showing real emotion might show that emptiness is an emptiness of humanity. Perhaps he doesn't have those emotions that human beings need in order to feel connected to the world. However, this speech continues. He then says, out, out brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. 
it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now you'll notice, as he continues his speech, we've got this out-out brief candle, which reminds us, it harks back to when Lady Macbeth said, out damn spot. I think it's supposed to show how life is so easily extinguished. Like we are all candles and we only have a brief time upon the earth. And that extinguishing of the light shows our brevity and our frailty. Lady Macbeth is a brief candle. Remember, Lady Macbeth was carrying a candle because she was desperately trying to cling on to some sort of light in her life. He then says, life's but a walking shadow, and he uses this metaphor. And the reason why this, um, why this speech is so well respected is brings together lots of the imagery used throughout the text and reuses it to make a point about how difficult life can be. So this metaphor is suggesting that life is like walking in darkness and therefore there's very little light or hope in the human condition. He then says a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. And here he's now suggesting that mankind are actors. So we're comparing real human beings to like actors on a stage. And Shakespeare does this very frequently. He does this in lots of other texts. He does this in a speech by Jacques as well. So we've got this idea of we're all just playing a little part, but like on a stage, our time comes and we disappear and you never see that character again. Like the stage is reality and we only get a very brief amount of time on stage. And he says that we spend our life struts and frets his hour upon the stage. Now, how limited our life seems when he describes it as we only get an hour upon the stage and then we're gone. So he's suggesting our time on the stage of life is limited. And it's very difficult to achieve anything of importance in such a short part, in such a short time of life. He suggests that life is painful and it offers no rests because we're constantly strutting and fretting. Strutting means to walk around, fretting means to worrying. So suggesting that we get this time on stage and yet it's not comfortable. He then says, and then is here no more, shows that finality of death, suggesting that there's no hope, there's no afterlife, that death is the end. One moment we are breathing, living human beings. And the next minute we're dead. Very difficult to comprehend. And he does this in Hamlet as well with the character of Yorick. Alas, poor Yorick, for I knew him well. We've got this idea that it's, it's difficult for people to just disappear. He's no longer going to see his wife again. And then he says, it is a tale told by an idiot. We have this extra metaphor of life being a poorly considered story by someone who is incapable of telling it appropriately. So life is meaningless. We're all just playing a really bad part in a really bad play by someone who can't write very good plays. And then he suggests that we're full of sound and fury. Lots of noise, lots of action, but very little meaning. Life is full of noise and action, and yet nothing really matters at all. And that final line, I think, is about as pessimistic as it gets. He says, life has no meaning, signifying nothing. Either he realises that life means nothing at all, or that life without Lady Macbeth means nothing. Either way, I think this speech that we have with Macbeth shows the emptiness in his life, and that emptiness of emotion, and that emptiness of value too. The rest of Act 5, Scene 5 is devoted to a conversation between the messenger and Macbeth. The messenger arrives and tells Macbeth the news about Burnham Wood seemingly marching on Dunsandane. Now we have dramatic irony here. The audience knows that this is the English force coming towards Scotland to retake the throne. However, this is the first moment Macbeth realises that one of the prophecies of the witches is coming true. Now he doesn't get completely disheartened at this point because he still believes that there's one other prediction that hasn't come true yet, so that will protect him. 
he cannot be killed by anyone of woman born. So he still feels like he is invincible and invulnerable, even though Burnham Wood is now marching on Dunstane. Now, what I'd like to do is just explain what happens at the end of Macbeth. Now, whilst I won't go through the final scenes and I won't look at any of the characters or analyse any of the text with you, I think it's probably useful for you to understand what happens at the end of the text. So, Malcolm's army arrives at Dunsedain and he traps Macbeth inside the castle. Macbeth, who is emboldened by those witches' prophecies, he agrees to fight. Now, at first, a young character called Young Seward challenges him, and Macbeth kills him. Then Macduff enters the castle with Seward. And remember, one of the prophecies of um, the witches was that Macbeth should be weary of Macduff. Now, young Seward's father, Seward, also enters at this point. Macbeth begins to fight Macduff. And at first, he seems to have the upper hand. He's filled with the confidence that the witches gave him by giving him that prediction. And Macbeth tells Macduff that he lives a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. And at that moment, Macduff reveals that he was, from his mother's womb, untimely ripped. So we learn that Macduff was not born in the way children normally get born to mothers. He was taken from his mother's womb before he should have been born, therefore not really born of a woman. He was born by caesarean section. And that reveals to Macbeth that all of the predictions are coming true, and therefore he is not as invincible as he thought. Macduff then kills Macbeth. And by killing Macbeth, Malcolm is then declared the rightful king of Scotland. So at the end of this text, Shakespeare shows us that if we do evil things to gain, we will not get away with it. It's one of the moral messages of the text. That if you challenge the natural order, if you fight against the king and go against the divine right of being and God himself, then there will be justice, there will be repercussions. So we end up with Malcolm on the throne, the person who should be there, and that Scotland can then move back towards prosperity. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope it's useful. I hope it allows you to understand the text in a little bit more depth, and I hope it allows you to enjoy the text as well. I think when we understand the text really, really well, you can start to see its majesty, you can start to see its impressiveness, and you can also see that it is a text worth reading. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching along. I will speak to you all next time.